and welcome to the first lesson for this comprehensive web design series. Now this first set of videos is going to be covering what I call internet infrastructure, which we're going to try to demystify some of the way the internet works. We're going to be talking about routers and servers and internet connections and some of the protocols that govern how the internet works in order to help you gain a solid foundational set of information that'll help you much later on when we get to the more technical details of building and designing web pages. Initially about what HTTP is. That's something that you probably type in your web browser every single time you visit a website. So we're going to talk about what that is and how the protocol works. Now, before we do that, let's start out with the basics of talking about a network. Now, a network is simply two computers that are linked together somehow. Now, typically there's a physical connection between the two computers, and that is what we call the router. So there's a piece of equipment that's only job is sort of to talk to one another and send traffic back and forth between various computers on a network. Now there's also technology. A lot of routers these days are also routers and also Wi-Fi gateways that can also push internet signals wirelessly. But there's always some sort of interface that connects these two computers together. Now, if you sort of take that concept and you expand it a little bit, what if we have, for example, at a college or university, it has multiple campuses in separate physical locations, and those campuses are interconnected with one another. And that's really the same thing as a local area network. It's just on a bigger scale. So instead of having in the same home two computers, we have computers networked across cities even, or you know, major geological locations. Now, if we take that concept one step further and we go across the entire globe, that is what we call a worldwide web or WWW. So that's a global network of computers that are interconnected across cities, states, or even countries and oceans. Now, one interesting thing to think about is it's pretty easy to think about my computer being connected to my computer in my office, or maybe colleges could be connected because we can see those physical cables, you know, uh, lying around our cities. But how do we connect, let's say, one continent with another continent? This is something quite interesting that a lot of people don't know. The continents are actually connected via physical cables that lie on the bottom of the ocean floor. So these are called submarine cables. This website here called submarinecablemap.com, this is actually an interactive map. You can click on each individual cable and it will tell you what company owns that cable. So a lot of times, because these are very, very expensive to build, several companies will sort of lay one together or even governments and states can sponsor these cables to be laid on the ocean floor. But that's how the internet works across multiple countries is along these same physical connections that lay on the bottom of the ocean floor. Now, the reason the internet is able to work so quickly, for example, if I go to my website and I type in a website that's let's say in Europe and I'm based in the United States, it almost instantaneously pops up. And that's because the internet travels along these cables at the speed of light. So these are called fiber optic cables. And these fiber optic cables are cables that are made of glass fibers and light gets shot along these glass fibers. So the signal or the data that's transferred between these various endpoints travel at the speed of light, which is very, very quickly. I think it's something like the speed of light can go around the world eight times in a single second around its entire circumference. So that's how the internet travels so quickly. On land, the internet still travels through these fiber optic cables, but it's typically buried underneath the, the ground somewhere, three meters or something like that. And that's why whenever you dig, whenever you have to do a construction project, you'll typically have to call your, your uh, city or your, you know, your authorities there and get a permit to dig because they want to make sure that where you're digging there's no fiber optic cables running that you're unaware of. Because if you dig through those with a backhoe or something like that, you've essentially just knocked out the internet to whoever was downstream from where you're at. So that's kind of how it works. Now, once the internet reaches your home, typically it's not on fiber optic cables. Those are typically in these trenches, which we call the internet backbone. Once the internet reaches your house, it typically runs over an electrical signal to go actually into your house and that travels very very quickly but not as fast as the speed of light in some newer developments 
you'll actually see fiber connectivity going straight into the homes. So that's something that almost all new developments are building into it, but a lot of the older homes don't have the infrastructure to have fiber optic cable run directly to each individual address. So now that you understand a little bit about how that works, let's talk about the basics of HTTP. Now HTTP is simply a protocol and the uh, protocol here, HTTP, is what we call the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And it's a set of rules that govern how two computers are supposed to talk to one another. So in the simplest form, we have a computer here and the computer that you're working at or that you're consuming is what we call the client machine. Sometimes that's also referred to as the local machine. Now the computer that you're interfacing with that actually houses the website files that you're pulling up is what we call the server or the remote computer. And of course we have the router in between the two that does the actual talking. We'll talk a little bit more about routers and, and some other things in a, letter, in a later tutorial, but we're just gonna cover the basics in this one. So what happens is the client machine makes a request to the server and the server machine has a response that it sends back to the client. So we have a request and a response and those two things always happen over HTTP. Now what happens here is when this request happens, so this is guy is gonna send a request over here and this server is basically gonna ask itself a question. It says, do I have the files that the client machine is requesting? So it's gonna respond back and send back a response with sort of yes or no. And if it has the files that were requested, it of course sends those files along. If it does not have the files that were requested, it will send an error or a status code. So the server always responds with what is known as a status code. And those status codes are simply three digit numbers. And that helps the client to know, you know, yes or no, or correct or incorrect, or if the files were found or not. So let's take a look at some of those status codes that the server can send back. So the status codes are broken down into three digit numbers, 100 through 500. And the 100 series numbers are simply informational status codes. The 200 series numbers typically mean a success. So if you pull up a web page, if I go to google.com and hit return, and it actually shows me the web page, the status code that was sent back from the server, remember the server is sending all these status codes over to the client, it would have the number 200, which means okay or success. Now, 300 status codes are redirections. So if you have a one website that redirects to another website, that would be a 300 status code. So the server would say, I don't have the files, but it's gonna redirect you to the place that does have the files. 400 uh, status codes are what we call client errors. Now I'm sure you've probably seen these, but you've never realized it because if you pull up a web page and you get a number that's called a 404 and it says page not found, that's the error status code for the file was not found. So if you try to pull up a website or a file and the server looks for it, but it doesn't have it, it's gonna send back the status code of 404, which means, sorry, I don't have the file you're looking for. And then the browser displays that little error message. Okay, and then the last series here are the 500 status codes. Those status codes typically mean something's actually broken on the server itself. So it was busy or it had a hiccup or it crashed or something. The server wasn't able to process the request properly. It will send back a 500 code telling you that something was wrong. So that's the status codes. Now let's talk a little bit about what we call the get and request response headers. So remember how we talked about how that each request sent by the HTTP client, remember there's a request and a response, that request goes through what's known as a header, okay? Now you can sort of think of like the header is the first few lines of the request that gets, that gets sent. And it's made up of three parts. So the first part is what we call the start line. And the start line is made up of, you can see three portions here. Then we have the actual headers, which has some additional information. And then we have the body. Now in this particular example, let's talk about the start line first. So the start line you can see starts with what we call the method. So this is how the request is being put together. It's typically either get or post. Next, we have what we call the target. So this is which exact file am I trying to locate? And then the third parameter is the version of HTTP that we're using. HTTP has several versions, one, 1.1, 1 
2 and even version 3 is under development. So that's all part of the very first line that gets sent. So the, ver the method, the target, and the version. And then the headers typically just has additional information um, about the request. So in this little sample here, you can see we have the user agent. That's what web browser I'm using. That's sent to the server because that's helpful information for the server to be able to process the request. And when we're sending a request, typically there's nothing in the body of the request. That's typically what the server uses to send back the files that are requested. Okay, so let's take a look at the response. It's very similar here. So the server is going to give you the response. It also has these header files that are made up of these three specific parts. So the first part is what we call the starting line. And you can see that it's a, the order's a little bit different here in the way these things are laid out. We have the headers, which is you know information about the file that it's sending back. And then we have the body, which is the actual resource that the server is going to send back. So let's take a look at the start line again. You can see first here we have the version. So it comes at the beginning of the start line. These are the status codes that we just talked about previously. And then lastly here, we have the status text, which is where we say are not found. Okay, and then the headers and then the body. So let's take a look at actually what these, uh, what we call these HTTP headers look like in a real request. So here's an actual header and an actual response. So you can see here from the request header that there's several interesting pieces of information that we can take a look at. So remember all of these request headers here are sent by the browser. So it is sending all of these various, this is a, you can see the host is for YouTube. And here's my user agent. This tells me, this tells the web server what browser I'm using. Here's the language, a few things like that. And then here's the response from the server. So it sends back all of the various things that the server needs to send the actual file. So that's kind of what they actually look like. Your headers, the response headers, and the request headers will look very differently depending on the request and the server and how those things are configured. But they're always made up of those three basic parts. Okay, so to sort of overview here, just a couple of notes. So HTTP is what we call a stateless protocol. Now, what that means is when the request, so if, if we have over here, if you remember back, we have these two computers here, our client, when our client sends the request, and the server sends back the response, the connection is broken between those two. So there's not, it's not maintained. You don't stay on the line and listen to the server. It's sort of like you call in, the server says, okay, and hangs up the phone and then sends the files. So there's not a maintained connection. So it's a stateless protocol. So every single time you hit refresh or click on a new resource on a web server, you have to reinitiate the request and re-receive that response. Okay, the actual HTTP itself is based on the TCP IP protocol, which is just a, another sort of uh, networking protocol. And just remember there's three parts to the request and the header response. Okay, now let's take a look at this in action so we can actually see how this works. So you can see here, I have opened up the Firefox web browser. And inside of Firefox, I'm going to show you how this request and response works. So I'm just going to come over here and I'm going to type in youtube.com slash follow Andrew, which is, of course, the name of my YouTube channel, which you should definitely be subscribed to. And let's hit return. Now, what I want you to watch is down here in the network tab, what happens when I hit return. So as soon as I hit return, that whole HTTP cycle is going to happen. And you can see here it's actually happening a lot. Every single one of these lines down in this entire network panel is a separate HTTP request. So the very first request you make is for the HTML file. But if that HTML file has any additional assets like images or movies or JavaScript files, CSS files, each one of those assets has to be re-requested individually from the server. So there's a whole new request and a whole new response that happens for every single asset. And you can see here listed here down here at the bottom, there are 71 separate requests that were required from the client to the browser just for this one single web page from one single visitor. So you can imagine if you have thousands of people visiting the same website at the same time, each individual one of those persons has to make 71 requests and response that travel from my house to California and back in fractions of a second. So it's amazing how this all works together. 
Now over here on the far left, you can kind of see the status codes. So you can see the number 200, which you should know now means A-OK. -okay. So this is good. If you see red or 404s or different numbers over here, that's not a good thing. That means something's broken. And what I want you to take a look at, I'm just going to click on the very top one here. In Firefox's developer tools, uh, you can, of course, right click and say inspect element. That's what pulls up this little dialog. If you're in Chrome, it'll work by default. If you're in Safari, you have to go into the preferences to enable that feature. And in Internet Explorer, it's under their developer tools. So you can see here we have the headers, which we talked about a minute ago. And we have our response and request headers. So again, the request headers are the headers that the client sent over to the server. And you can see there's a bunch of information here. And the response is what the uh, server sent back to the client. And there's, of course, a bunch of information here as well. Now, if you're not sure what these things mean, you can always click on the little information icon. This is available inside of Firefox. But if I click on that little icon, it'll just take me to a documentation page, which tells me what that specific header uh, means. In this case, we have the content length header, and it indicates the size of the body in bytes. So for example, if I was to pull up a JPEG image and I'm loading that JPEG in my browser, I would likely have a header called content length and that would show me the bytes or how large that file size was. So that's kind of how you can take a look at each individual piece of information on the request and response cycle from the server. So in the next video tutorial, we're going to be looking at a few additional things. We're going to be looking at domain names and IP addresses and routers. We're going to be looking at DNS servers. We're going to be looking at cache and cookies which are all additional bits of information that help websites and web browsers work. In fact, you can see right here, there's a little tab called cookies. So we're gonna talk about those in an upcoming tutorial. So don't forget to give a thumbs up, like, and we will see you in the next one.